Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Kramer. I'm the Chief uh, Technology Strategist at the Stanford University Libraries, and I have had the pleasure and thrill of working on IIIF uh, over the last five or six years uh, with some excellent collaborators. And I'm pleased to have the chance to talk to uh, many of you who I hope will become collaborators if you are not already. Before we start, I wonder um, if how many people are brand new to IIIF and if uh, this is really their first in-depth exposure. Could you please just raise your hand? Okay, so it's about half of the room. Now, here's the counterpart. How many people are in IIIF and are here to take it to the next level already? Could you raise your hand? It's about the other half, so that's good. I'm not sure if anyone voted twice, but that's okay. Um, for those of you who are here for the first time today, uh, you're going to see a, a handful of people speaking up on the stage, but half of the room is already participating in some level and some area, and I would encourage you to make the most of your time here, um, not just to listen and see what's presented on the stage, but also to interact with everyone here, because that has in fact been one of the key drivers of success for the initiative so far, and I think you, there is a lot to learn. As Sheila pointed out, we have several opportunities towards the end of the day to really interact uh, with experts from across the community. So um, Ambrosio, I think, actually gave a wonderful and very much more pithy introduction to IIIF uh, just previously to this. Um, but I'm gonna go through some of this with a, a few visual aids in a little bit more detail. And really, uh, the fundamental pre premise for IIIF is that images are the fundamental uh, information carriers for cultural heritage and research materials today on the web. Um, they underline everything from uh, museum objects, books, manuscripts, newspapers, uh, musical scores, maps, uh, scrolls, and visual materials. Um, but if you think about the way we present images on the web today, in general, it's a rather static and passive experience. They're basically presented as uniform blobs that are up on the web that you have to download. And there's a notion of viewing, but not necessarily an appreciation for the fact that images are resources with which you interact. And that viewing is not a passive activity. In fact, you want to zoom and pan. Uh, you may want to manipulate, annotate, load into different software environments. And um, the current state of affairs really reflects the traditional way that we've delivered images on the web, which is, uh, in fact, it's, it's a little bit hard. Um, delivery of images, especially large images, uh, can be slow. Large images being something that we in cultural heritage and research institutions particularly deal with. Um, the delivery of images across different sites or technology stacks tends to be highly idiosyncratic, where uh, the, the solution and the framework that one site or one repository or one institution may use is radically different than what you will encounter from a different site. Uh, this gives uh, users, researchers, patrons a rather disjointed and uneven environment to navigate across. Uh, and frankly, it's, uh, it's rather unappealing. And we all suffer because of it. Uh, not only the end users who are trying to access image-based resources potentially from more than one site, uh, but also the cultural heritage and research institutions, uh, such as many that are represented here, which are trying to maximize the impact and the reach of their resources, which is why they put it on the web in the first place. And also the technology providers, uh, those who are writing uh, software or hosting services, because they have to navigate across multiple different technology platforms, and it really limits what they're able to do. So can we imagine uh, a different environment? So this is, this is what we call what ifing in the United States. Can you imagine uh, what if deep zoom were standard and fast? Uh, this is a pixel of a scroll from Princeton University Libraries. I believe it's 160,000 pixels on the long edge. Where's John? Uh, more or less, he's, he'll, he'll allow the rounding. Um, and it's being served out of, uh, out of a image server, image delivery server called Loris. Uh, five or six years ago when IIIF started, this wouldn't be possible. Uh, if we're on a live site and you wanted to zoom in, uh, you can see the incredible levels of detail uh, that come with this. In this case, we have a, uh, a Japanese warrior standing on a cloud, which I think is a precursor to cloud-based environments. 
uh, with people downstairs looking up and saying, what are you doing up there? I mentioned size. Uh, we deal in large images, uh, and this is an example of both a large image and a very large real-world object. Uh, this is a Japanese tax map from the 19th century, and um, the gentleman standing in the corner is Wayne Vanderkeel, who is our lead photographer at Stanford. Uh, Wayne is about six foot four inches tall, is a little bit over two meters. So this map is two Waynes by three Waynes in size. <laughs> and it was actually constructed, uh, it's, it's great, it's not life size, but it's at such large scale because it was meant uh, for the tax assess assessors to actually stand in the middle on the lake and they could read the tax information on the province. So this, is, this has been widely used in the study of cartography um, and uh, uh, at Stanford uh, in a number of courses. We've digitized it, it's now available online. The same story, if you go to that uh, URL down below, you'll be able to see with incredible levels of detail an image uh, is multi-gigabyte image. Uh, what if you could compare images across different sites? One of the things that we all find as uh, holders of cultural information objects is we don't have the world uh, in our repositories and our materials only make sense and achieve their true value when they're viewed in the context with objects that exist outside. In this case, we have an image from um, uh, the Harvard Library, uh, the Harvard Art Museums, uh, excuse me, and one from the Digital Bodleian, uh, which is Oxford's digital library, that are being pulled in dynamically from two different sites and actually can be viewed side by side. So if you're interested in studying portraiture, for example. Um, an even more pathological example, and uh, one which I hope you'll see a better demo of sometime in the next few days, uh, what if you could collect items that physically belong together, not just intellectually? Uh, in this case, as those who have studied manuscripts know, um, there are a lot of people, uh, precursors to comic books, who just like the pictures, um, and the text was maybe less interesting. At some point um, since the creation of this manuscript and present day, the folio uh, of the folio, the miniature was extracted and went into the collections of the B Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Um, the text uh, ended up in a regional library and is hosted uh, from a different cultural institutions, uh, the Bibliothèque, the BVMM, uh, which is, I believe, basically the Virtual Library of Medieval Manuscripts. Uh, translated. Uh, and these are actually both been digitized and are on offer from two different sites. Um, based on the work that our colleagues at the BNF and Biblissima have done, um, you can actually deliver these materials together from two different sites uh, in two different technology stacks from two different institutions, each holding their, uh, continuing to hold their collections, but actually these are unified for scholarship once again. What if you could do uh, uh, more advanced things or the things we all expect from uh, digital resources now? What if you could search within uh, full text objects with hit highlighting and uh, showing the, uh, the regions of interest? Uh, in this case, this is a newspaper. Uh, what if you could uh, analyze images, in this case a non-geolocated um, uh, map, uh, using the Cloquen Technologies georeferencer, uh, they actually use IIIF to pull in digitized map images, plot them onto the curvature of the earth using various control points, and turning what's otherwise a flat image uh, into uh, a scientifically computable resource that is mapped to the uh, curvature of the earth. What if you could do things like annotate images? Uh, in this case, this is an uh, image of a cell that was produced for the uh, Harvard X um, course on cellular biology and uh, the courses and um, curators, and you'll see more about this uh, later this week, actually went through this uh, handcrafted image, produced highly detailed annotations, and in a side panel, give you details about what the cellular structures are that you're looking at. What if you could deliver image-based resources not from the application or the viewer that was attached to a given website, but one of your choice? Um, this is work uh, that was done by COGAP uh, for the Qatar National Library, for the Qatar Digital Library. And if you go to the Qatari website, you'll see um, uh, a great uh, contemporary cutting-edge presentation of digital archival materials. Because they chose to use IIIF and expose the entire contents of their library via IIIF, you can actually view this same archival uh, document through the viewer of your choice. In this case, and things that you'll hear about, uh, the Mirador viewer, the Universal viewer, and the Internet Archive book reader. 
um, all with no additional effort on COGAP's part or the Qatar uh, National Library. And what if all of this were actually possible right now? And that is, in fact, uh, what IIIF exists to do. All of these are, in fact, live examples or real-life examples of uh, the kinds of capacity that are, are brought together by this framework. So IIIF, the original vision for it was to create a global framework um, by which image-based resources writ large from any participating institution uh, delivered via any uh, kind of technology stack could be uh, viewed, rendered, and manipulated in any uh, compatible application all to any user on the web. So we're dramatically reducing the friction of uh, accessing, delivering, and consuming Im digital images on the, on the web. And furthermore, um, as part of the vision, uh, what if we could bring together tens of millions of image-based resources backed by a world -leading, uh, consortium of world-leading cultural heritage and research institutions um, with a rich and growing suite of software tools and that used uh, the latest standards and the evolving standards of web technology um, rather than something that was uh, particular to one particular environment actually weave IIIF into the web using the web's inherent framework. And uh, I believe you'll see throughout the course of the day that we're in fact well on our way to achieving this and in some cases have already, have already exceeded the original vision. So that's great, that's a lot of highfalutin talk. What exactly is IIIF? Um, so first of all, uh, we think of IIIF as four interleaved things. One is it's a community of institutions and individuals that are developing shared APIs or application programming interfaces, implementing them in software, and then exposing interoperable content uh, to be able to, uh, th that is consumed and rendered by that software. And to go through each one of these items in brief, and you'll hear more about each of these today, um, at this point, IIIF, tr the first I is for uh, international. It truly, truly is a global affair. There are more than 120 individual institutions that we are aware of, uh, which means it's in fact a much greater number um, from uh, nearly every continent on Earth. The, in terms of uh, the world leading consortium of blue chip institutions, we have a fantastic set of uh, museums and galleries, content aggregators, uh, an impressive list of state and national libraries, uh, and some of the world's great universities and research institutions. These are just a handful. Uh, if you actually try to put them all on the slide, it's about a six-point font. Um, furthermore, IIIF is not just institutions. It's actually a committed set of individuals who are working together collaboratively in order to understand uh, the opportunities and needs, uh, the use cases around interoperable image delivery, to uh, specify the APIs, to develop the software, and to develop patterns and best practices for leveraging those capabilities for the benefit of research and scholarship. So this is a picture of this meeting that happened last year at the Museum of Modern Art and the New York Academy of Medicine in New York City. A big part of IIIF is the community, and Sheila's gonna describe this in more detail uh, later. Uh, but basically, if you're wondering who is IIIF or where did these things come from, it's from the people uh, like those in this room and that we'll be meeting Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Every two weeks, we have an open community call which usually has 30 to 40 participants. It goes for an hour long and it alternates between in-depth discussions on the technology versus updates and advances on the community front. There are six currently active community groups working in distinct areas such as audiovisual, uh, discovery, manuscripts, uh, newspapers, and museums, as well as software development. And we've had 11 face-to-face -face, uh, multi-day meetings since the initiative began to get off the ground in 2011 with a first meeting that was uh, held at Cambridge University. IIIF is also about uh, communication. Um, so in 2011 and 2012, we started a Google group as a way to facilitate communication, and you can see the membership uh, and how it has climbed year over year. Uh, we're about um, a little less than halfway through 2017, uh, but we're on pace to have more than 1,000 members uh, actively participating or lurking on the IIIF discuss list uh, uh, in the next year to two years. 
Um, Slack, which is an instant messaging platform, has also really taken off in the last year. Um, our Slack statistics, we have nearly 64,000 um, uh, messages that have been exchanged. And if you look at just the pattern of usage across the week, you can tell that this isn't a, a, a once, once a day or once a week affair. This is actually something that is going on continuously. IIIF has become one of the major ways in which institutions, software developers, and researchers with particular needs are actually working together to advance their common interests. Um, one of those interests is uh, shared application programming interfaces. And uh, this is really the crux of IIIF and one of the reasons it's um, so broadly used by so many different users and so many different use cases with so many different software packages. And um, just to introduce APIs, one of, the, one of the ways that technology is typically uh, structured or that you can look at it is you have things like databases. Um, so in this case, these might be four or five uh, different uh, web applications on the internet delivering content out uh, through specific types of uh, logic or application. So data coming out through an application to users. Um, and th the way we have traditionally operated these in cultural heritage institutions and the, the way the internet evolved over the last decade was really every individual site was a silo. There was uh, little to no interoperability built in, not by design, but just because uh, we didn't have the standards or, and it was easier to, and safer and better to do it on your own. Um, every application was a one-off, uh, which means individual application developers were writing their own code, building their own system uh, to go over their own database, uh, and there was very little technology sharing. Uh, and every single user was forced to cope uh, with uh, all of these different environments, these different user interfaces, uh, and these different affordances. And this has become sort of a meme for IIIF. Uh, basically what we had is a great world of silos uh, with a grand pronouncement, especially for cultural heritage and research, is that of course we cooperate but we had built individual technical stacks and content silos that were hard to penetrate or to work across. And so you might have this little catwalk across the top uh, where people could go from silo to silo and pull out the information that they wanted. Um, this is where application programming interfaces come in. And I know that is not the title of this. This is the creation of Adam from the Sistine Chapel, but I think it's a great metaphor for an API. Because an API provides a, a, a structured and designed way for two systems to interact with each other. Uh, in this case, uh, Adam and God. And they're, with their fingers intersecting, they're actually doing the exchange of information. And that, I think, is what we had in mind, or what may have inspired the original idea behind IIIF, which is to, instead of doing um, straight exchange from a, a database to an application is to instead introduce this layer of APIs or this consistent way of exchanging information between applications and data stores uh, so you could have still your rich and um, highly contextualized uh, customized application but you could expose the same content through new services in different applications and if uh, not only does this provide institutional advantage but if you move into uh, multiple systems and multiple providers, software providers and um, uh, backend repositories, all using the same API, you get this rich framework and an ecosystem develops where everyone only has to write to one API and they get the benefits of multiple software packages and multiple content stores. Within IIIF, you're gonna get a little bit of a, a tour about these APIs, and I'll do some foreshadowing. Um, there are two core APIs, and this is where IIIF started. One is an image API, and that is basically a way to get pixels um, onto your screen. And the other is a presentation API, which is just enough metadata to drive a remote viewing experience. We were not, uh, many of us coming from library backgrounds, trying to come up with yet another universal metadata standard, but instead a very narrow set of information that could be, that was scoped to driving a remote viewing experience and remote applications. The image delivery API looks something like this. Um, and you'll hear more about this, but basically you can take an image and then using uh, a, a string of parameters in a URL, uh, you can actually select a region of interest, uh, customize the size, do rotation, and get it in various formats. And as we were collecting use cases and designing the image API, we felt that this addressed 80 to 90% of the use cases um, that were actually out in the wilds. 
The second major API is the presentation API, and it's good to get the pixels, but for image-based resources, they come with things, if it's a, a scanned book or a manuscript, it's got page sequences, it's got a title, uh, it's got a source institution with attribution and maybe a logo. The presentation API pro provides all of this information. And when you put the image and the presentation API together, you actually get a quite powerful uh, delivery. So this is a presentation um, of a Harvard manuscript, and you can see that the elements in red are delivered via the presentation API, and the image data uh, comes from um, the, the image API, uh, highlighted in blue. There are three more APIs that have been developed, um, or, uh, that have either been developed or in the process of being developed. One is a search API, which allows you for full text objects to be able to search within. Uh, it's like uh, control F inside a Word document or a PDF. There's an authentication API, uh, which lets a site uh, challenge for authentication in case it wants to do differential levels of access. So you have to, if you have to log in or if you have to be on a certain network in order to see the full resource or any of the resource. Uh, and the last one, which you hear about at the end of the day today, is audiovisual materials. One of the natural and, and very gratifying outcomes of IIIF is people said, this is so rich and so useful for images, can you do the same thing for um, time-based media? because I want the same kind of affordances to drive the remote viewing experiences and to enable annotation. So APIs are fantastic, but they're actually useless uh, to people unless they're realized in software that's operating on top of content. And uh, another of the very gratifying uh, developments around IIIF is that we've seen um, a couple of custom-built software applications or purpose-built software applications around actually leveraging IIIF, um, but we've seen an even greater number of applications that were uh, already existed or were developed with IIIF in mind, and have, uh, uh, IIIF compatibility has been retrofitted in. This is just a partial list, um, but we have things like image servers, uh, deep zoom clients, and a growing number of uh, applications which allow you to consume IIIF. And if you're using one of these image servers, and IIIF has been enabled, uh, you can use any one of these software clients. If you're using one of these software clients and you are interested in actually consuming resources from any IIIF institution using one of these servers, you likewise can consume any of those. The um, last thing, uh, one other thing that's developed on the uh, software side is that the uh, we're seeing a growing number of uh, service providers and major software vendors that are getting requests to work IIIF in. So within the, uh, the museum community, for example, uh, the IIIF museum interest group recently released a request that uh, digital asset management providers incorporate IIIF in as a, a core functionality. Um, and we've received some early signs that in fact a number of them, one of them has already done so, others are in the works and we're seeing that in fact you may not need to run your own image server at all, it could just be part of a turnkey package. Um, the last uh, bit about IIIF is that it's all about the software is useful but with image-based resources you actually need the content. This is one of the great challenges of IIIF is it's very difficult to count what's available on the internet. It's as big potentially as the web itself. Um, that said, uh, we recently orchestrated a survey of um, uh, IIIF institutions and came back with an estimated number of 335 million images online that are accessible via IIIF today. Um, this is almost certainly a dramatic undercount uh, given the nature of the survey. We are, rap if we're not already there, we are rapidly approaching more than a billion um, uh, high quality customized or high quality uh, scholarly assets that are available in this framework with more coming online um, uh, every month. Uh, just last week, the Getty, Getty uh, and the Yale Center for British uh, Art both announced that they were releasing tens of thousands of images online that were accessible via IIIF. And just to give you a taste of the IIIF universe, um, this is a snapshot of um, it's basically some exemplar content um, that can be loaded out of uh, the Mirador viewer. And you can see um, University of College Dublin, Harvard, a Japanese institution, 
um, the Blissima, the National Library of Wales, the National Gallery of Art, and the Yale Center for British Art are all exposing content ranging from maps to manuscripts uh, to visual resources to photography. Um, this gives you kind of a sampler platter. So to wrap up, um, IIIF is the content, um, it is the software, it is the community, it is the APIs. Why is it actually useful for individual users? Um, it gives you rich image delivery, it becomes a standard. You are able to plug and play different technologies to mix, mix and match with each other. You can publish information to the web and image to the web once and it can be reused in multiple ways. No more copying images around or uh, producing multiple technology stacks for slightly variant needs. Has support for attribution and access control. You can remix content from others uh, using comparison features. You can cite and share, it's annotation friendly, and you're joining by using IIIF, joining a global network of uh, the world's great uh, research institutions and uh, increasingly the software developers. So uh, just the impressions for IIIF. Francisca Frey from Harvard uh, had a great saying at one of our meetings. It's like going from the 18th century to the 21st century in a single click. Glenn Robson from the National Library of Wales uh, said, Triple IF is good for us, Triple IF is also good for sharing. Uh, referring to it just makes sense from the National Library of Wales perspective to implement Triple IF from an economy and efficiency standpoint, but it also gets their resources out. Richard Higgins from Durham University says that Triple IF doesn't just keep you out of silos, it keeps you out of dead ends in terms of delivering your information online. So, um, this is a call for participation if you're here for the first time or a reminder to participate if you've been in IIIF before. Um, if you want to participate, the easiest thing to do is to use IIIF compatible software and content. Uh, if you are an institution with materials, expose them via IIIF. If you are a software developer, make your software IIIF compatible. If you're a customer of a software provider, uh, ask them to make their content or their software IIIF compatible. And finally, participate in the IIIF community, come to meetings like this, participate online in Slack, ask questions, offer advice, and basically join us. Thank you very much. <laughs>